right now we have uh, a special guest that's going to bring a word. Miss Shay Caffey um, is going to be bringing us our word today. And if you've never sat in one of Shay's uh, teachings before, she is one of the best teachers, Bible scholars, best teachers I've ever seen in my entire life. You guys know Jim and you know Shay. They are incredible, incredible people. Y'all please help make Shay welcome to the stage. Amen. Hey, Amen. You're on. Hello. Hello. Let me pray you. for you really quick. Lord Jesus, we love you. We honor you. We praise you. Have your way in everything that she says in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take it away. Hello, everybody. So for those of you who don't know why I'm wearing these, I had some eye stuff going on. And so these are my notes. I have flashcards. So I am so excited to be here today. I'm going to attempt to see if I can take. I cannot. Okay. <laughs> A little bit too bright. Um, first of all, welcome Revive. It is so good to be here. You have no idea how good it is to be here. Um, we've been through some seasons, and today's worship service was exactly what, um, yeah, the Holy Spirit knew. So I first of all just want to thank Pastor Shannon for letting me speak. And uh, it's going to be a little bit different for those of you <clears throat> who have been, <clears throat> excuse me, who have been in any of my classes, this is not the norm today because I can't see to read. So this is gonna be a special treat, hopefully for all of you. And I, I, the, the teaching is called, we, there we go. The teaching today is called a dash of salt. <laughs> Hi, husband. kindest person on the planet right there. Amen. Doesn't help that he's extremely good looking either. <laughs> so I'm going to start at Matthew 5.13 and it basically says you are the salt of the earth but if the salt loses its saltiness can it get its saltiness back? <laughs> and if it doesn't it's good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden underfoot. And I don't know about you but when I was growing up I didn't understand exactly what that verse meant. I thought, okay, when you get saved, you're salt. And you got to go around and you got to spread the gospel. And then maybe if you backslide or you don't care about spreading the gospel, that means you lost your saltiness and then you're pretty much good for nothing and you're not good for the kingdom anymore. Like, I didn't really understand what that verse meant. But I don't know about you, sometimes I've been in periods of my life where I felt like I was doing great things for the kingdom of God. And then there's been other times in my life where I felt like I was good for nothing. And I don't know if any of y'all have been through some of those periods. But to give you a little bit of a background on where this teaching came from, I have to give you a little background about my childhood. My parents, I was raised in Mansfield, Ohio. My parents, had a, we had a farm that we housed wayward teens and adults in the 70s. And there was five families on this farm. It was kind of like a little, it wasn't a compound, but anyway, we had a lot of strangers eating around my dining room table. And a lot of these homes housed these wayward people in their basements. And so I was constantly raised with strangers being brought into my home. And then my dad helped build a trail life camp, which is a, a military Christian summer camp that was free to the public. So we had a lot of foster kids and kids from the local public schools that would come every summer. And I cannot tell you the countless lives that were changed because of that camp. And then he also built, helped build Mansfield Christian School in Mansfield, Ohio. And I can't tell you the countless number of lives that were transformed there. He, I, th I think he built it when I was a baby and it's still going today. And my dad turned 86 yesterday. Happy birthday, dad. Um, that school is still thriving and changing lives. And one of those students actually started an orphanage in Thailand called Sending Hope. And he does a summer camp based off of Trail to Life Camp. And so my dad for years has done eBay so that he could raise money to give, to help save the lives of these little hill tribe girls whose lives would be horrible if they didn't have an orphanage to come to. So because he was a, a teacher, Bible teacher at that school, we always had high school kids at my house. 
and he was a taxidermist, so he, between mounting deer and fish, I could hear the pool balls, you know, rattling and all these high school kids laughing. And my mom would make a plethora of pie choices from the berries she picked on the fence line and tons of cookies. So I have known nothing else than the example set before me of being salt to the earth. My parents have done outreach. They've reached outside of their four walls and poured into other people. It's all I've ever seen. So when I got married and, and I moved to Texas, I had that gathering mentality. I wanted to help. And so I, I married a, a very kind person that entertained that idea. And we built a little addition on top of our garage, like a little happy days apartment. And since we've been married, I've housed over 30 people. And we've given each of them a dash of salt. And what do I mean by a dash of salt? Salting them. You're pouring into people outside of your family the virtues of God, the virtues of a godly marriage, the virtues of going forth and pouring into other people instead of just keeping it for you and your little family. And so some, some of our people required a little bit more salt than others. Uh, some we've emptied the whole salt shaker on. But they became so much a part of our family that they are our family. And I don't know about you, but there's a lot of people that adopt people to be part of their family. And that's what it's all about, doing life together and just, just bringing people in that aren't your biological people to show them that there is a God out there. I had big shoes to fill. So in 2009, I found my, my little niche. And it's the House of Hope Women's Shelter in Longview, Texas. It's an emergency rescue shelter for women off the streets. I had found a place where I could get 50 to 70 women at a time and just love on them and take them out for their birthdays once a month. And I have volunteers from this church that help me throw a party every month for my homeless ladies. And, and I started teaching Bible studies. That is when I found the website that just changed the way I teach, um, Blue Letter Bible. And the tools that that website offers has allowed me to study the Greek and the Hebrew and that's how I just fell in love with the Bible. Like, I have never fallen in love with the Bible. And so I began to amplify these scriptures, looking up one word at a time about spiritual armor. You know, are we teaching that right? Is this what that really means in the Greek? And so as I'm doing the spiritual armor, and then I'm like, well, let's move on to the, the gifts of the Spirit. Let's see if we're doing that right. And let's move into other things. Well, Pastor Rob from my previous church, we were there for 12 years, he was the first pastor that ever trusted me to teach. And he put me on a rotation on Wednesday night. And I don't know if he knows this, but if he's watching Pastor Rob, propelled me into my, my passion. Gave me that opportunity to, like, to teach people how to study the Bible and how to fall in love with it. And it has become my, um, my love. And... And so I started just speaking at women's conferences, and I was getting invited to other churches, and my classes were like, will you do Revelation? Will you amplify that book? And I'm like, it'll take a year. <laughs> but I did it in 2014, and, it, and it's done, and I was te I'm teaching it, and I've taught it through many times. But, and I just said to myself, this is it. I have found my niche, and I am never, never going to stop. And how many of you have heard that phrase, never say never? Never say never. In Thanksgiving of 2018, one week to the day after finishing Revelation at Revive or at Metro, no, at Revive, it was a, he, it was at the other building. My husband, my sweet husband, broke his foot. Thanksgiving Day 2018, and all teaching just came to a a, a two month pause because we have since moved into that addition above the garage and given my house to my daughter and my grandchildren, so they won't move away. You know, got to have that gathering thing. And so um, we're upstairs, and he can't go downstairs unless the, this man has to crawl. He would crab walk across the floor, crawl down the stairs backwards, crutch to the restroom, crutch back to the base of the stairs, crawl back up the stairs, and crawl to the recliner. And so I'm like, babe, what do you need? Let me go get it for you. I can do everything but your bathroom breaks. Let me just help you out here. 
And so for two months, and so February of 2019, I thought, yes, except for no, the enemy came against my, my, my children, my family, with a vengeance. And I thought, you know what? I've already taken two months off. What's a few more? What's, let's just take off a spring. Let's just take off a season. And I need, I'm needed on the home front, and I'm, I'm just going to stay home. Well, I really battled with, did I make the right decision? Did I, you know, was, this is an enemy attack. Did the enemy just win? Like, what? Am I, did I do the right thing? Because I was feeling a void. I mean, a huge void. How many of you have been just going along doing something you know God's called you to do? And you just have so much joy, and you can't wait to wake up every morning. You're just doing it. And then all of a sudden, something comes out of left field and just takes you right off your feet and your momentum just comes to a screeching halt yeah. Yeah. and it could be an illness in the family it could be a, a job change it could be just, it could be anything but it throws you off your plan off your path and i struggled with <laughs> and i'm not a sad person i struggled with depression i struggled with all kinds of stuff so, so sad Sorry, I was very sad. So I started to pull back from everybody because I didn't want to be the Debbie Downer, but I wasn't able to do what I love to do. So for 2019, sorry, I'll get it. <laughs> I decided I'm not gonna cry in my soup. I don't have all the free time in the world to study and teach. I'm gonna start peopling, I called it peopling. So when people say, why aren't you teaching? I was like, oh, I'm going to people this year. What's peopling? Oh, it's where I get together with people <laughs> instead of sitting in my corner studying all day. And so I would try to get together with one-on-one -on -one ladies for like coffee and then you know, tr inevitably try to talk about the Bible. And uh, so I peopled for 2019 while I dealt with crisis in, in the family. 2020, and, and at the end of... At the end of 2019, I kept telling Jim, we had a three-month break where things seemed to, like, let up. And I had the best three months at the end of 2019 than we've had in the past year. And I said, Jim, something bad's coming. I feel like the Lord's given me a little break, the calm before the storm. I could feel it in my spirit. I just didn't know what it was. And I was like, what could get worse than 2019? On me birthday, when our family's coming back from Branson for our spring break trip with my daughter and the grandchildren, we get a call. You, you better pick up some toilet paper while you're in Branson because ain't nothing in Longview. And I'm like, what? Oh, there's no toilet paper. There's no water. There's no whatever because COVID. Well, in Branson, they hadn't started shutting stuff down yet. We were still going to the shows. They were starting to limit the amount of people that could go in. And I'm like, what in the world? Why toilet paper? Anyway, you come home to Longview, and it's like on lockdown. So I would, at least in 2019, I could teach once a week at the shelter and people. 2020, everything in my life changed like your guys' lives. You're holed up in your house. You're watching people all around you die. I've never had so many people in my immediate circle die. Um, you don't know what's going to happen. And it was just an, a whole year of no peopling and no teaching and crisis in the family. And I thought, Lord, <laughs> what? I just don't even know what to do here. And, and you, just, you just trust. Like the, you know, it's like it's the giant. It's like I've got to face this giant. Why do I face this giant? I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds my tomorrow. And I'm just going to trust that he's got this. So in, in uh, 2021, things started to open up at the shelter. I got to at least go back and teach once a week there. But 2021 was still a year of peopling. And I was really like, oh, because the crisis was still the crisis. So October of 2021, and I don't usually remember my dreams, God gave me a dream that I remembered. And so about the only thing I had been doing at the church for the past two years is greeting. That's it. And I was just kind of keeping to myself. 
So 2021, October, I go to sleep, and I have this dream that I am in what looks like, almost like this room, but if it was oval over here, like a, a roller rink. There's tables set up all over the place, and the, the front is up there. And I'm standing up there all by myself. And I'm looking out over y'all, and a lot of you guys were actually in this dream, and you're all mingling on all of these tables. And I feel so disconnected from everybody at this point. So I'm up there by myself, and I look behind me and there's an easel with one of those big flip pieces of paper where you put like Pictionary, and there is a marker there. And I'm just kind of looking at it, and then all of a sudden, the whole ceiling is filled with TV screens like Bubba 66. And they're all playing different things, and the one I happen to look up at, Burt Reynolds comes on advertising something. It's random. But behind him is like the Sierra Mountains, such beautiful snow-capped mountains. And then the commercial goes off, and I'm like, you know what, I think I'm gonna draw with my artistic skills, the snow-capped mountains. So I grab the marker, and I'm like, you know, okay, for those of you who have seen a third grader draw mountains, yeah, it pretty much look like that. I draw the teepee with the swirlies at the top. I draw another teepee. This one's a little taller with the swirlies. It's, I draw another one with the swirlies at the top, and I'm like, ooh, how do you do depth? How do you make something look like it's way far back there? And so I do a little one off of one of the other ones, and I, a tiny little thing at the back, and I'm just kind of looking at it. And this is what it looked like. And then I drew a tiny little dot at the top of the mountain in the very back with an arrow. And I'm up there all by myself. And I said, that's me. That's how I feel. I felt so distant, so detached, so unseen, so unneeded, so unworthy. Whatever. I just, you know, pity party. <laughs> that's how I felt in the dream, too. And so I finished drawing, and I'm just, I'm just minding my own business. Here comes Pastor Roth from out of nowhere. And he goes, Shay, did you draw that? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, oh, my word. I have never seen anything like that before. Where's a microphone? And I'm like, what are you doing? What are you talking about? And he goes and he grabs a microphone and he's like, can I get everybody's attention, please? Well, everybody just look up here. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> and he goes, Shay just drew that. I have, Shay, I had no idea that you had that kind of talent. You have got to keep drawing. And I'm like, what? I'm so embarrassed. Y'all are staring at me. I turn around and the picture is gone. And what has taken its place is something like this. Now, I don't know if you can see color. I cannot. It looks like it's black, but that thing was pink. I can't draw it, so I had to take a picture of something like it. it was the most beautiful little pink elephant with little purple polka dots on her. And she was, it looked like Dumbo's girlfriend. And she was turned over her shoulder like this with just this little smirky smile. And I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh, I didn't draw that. <laughs> and I need to let everybody know that I didn't draw that because they're going to expect me to be able to draw that. And so I, I take the microphone. I said, can I have that microphone, please? <laughs> Get the microphone from him. And I turn around and I start to look more closely at this pink elephant. And what I see is, it is made up of tiny little objects. Well, I remember a pink blow dryer. I remember the little roulette wheels were purple. That's what was the polka dots, were tiny little roulette wheels. But it was a mosaic. And I don't know if you guys have ever looked up close at a mosaic, but it's just a bunch of rock crumbles in a mess until you step back and you see the Mona Lisa. Now I really know I can't do that. I'm like, there's no way. And so I turn to explain to you guys, I didn't do that. And every man in the room is gone. And it is only the women that are left. And I start to say, y'all, I didn't, I didn't draw that. And I'm thinking, how do I explain what I'm looking at up close? And I said, you, you ladies remember like in the 90s, those posters that had all the little speckles and like you stared at it and like crossed your eyes a little bit and then all of a sudden the 3D image came out and like only three of you raised your hand so I was like, okay, can't use that analogy. 
to let them, like, when I'm, and I said, I did not draw that. This is what I drew. And I start drawing my little mountain thing. And I said, that's what I drew. And when I turned again, after I finished drawing, I'm in a locker room. This is just such a random dream, but I'm in a locker room and I'm in between two sets of lockers and I'm talking to one lady who's a friend of my daughter's who has three children and I've probably spoken 10 words to her in all the years I've known her, but she's the one in my dream. And I was telling her, I was like, and so then I told the ladies, it's like, I didn't draw that. And then I, I drew that little dot because that's how I felt for the past three years. And, and, and the Holy Spirit dropped in a word to my head to give to her. And I said, you know, sometimes you feel like you're unseen, like nothing that you do matters. But God wants you to know that you're his masterpiece. And she just broke. And I'm like, and then I wake up. And I'm like, okay. Okay. So he's trying to tell me uh, I'm his masterpiece. He's trying to encourage me that, you know, I've, he's not disappointed in me, you know. I'm as mad. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard it all before, you know. I'm more interested in trying to figure out why Pastor Rob was in the dream. And uh, why when I turned around the first time, all the men were gone. And then when I turned around the second time, well, I'm in a locker room with one, one lady. Like, I want to understand the dream. And so I go to a couple friends of mine and tell them the dream. It's a man and a woman. And instantly they're like, okay, so this will preach. This will preach. This is, you know, you could preach so many things from, from that, or not the other one. You could preach so many things from the mountains. And I'm like, listen to all the things. I'm like, yeah, I could, but I just feel like there's something in this message I'm missing. And so then I took it to um, my father figure, my daddy, um, not my real daddy, my adopted daddy. And I said, I told him the dream. And he's like, okay, this is what I'm seeing. You know, everybody wants to, this is what I see. And I'm like, yeah, I see all that too, but that's mm, not, mm, it's not it. I'm missing something. And then I go to the roost every Tuesday morning for tea for twos with my, one of my dearest friends, Lynn Littlefield. Will you stand up? Let's, Lenny, I know I'm just going to embarrass you, everybody. Y'all, this is Lynn Littlefield. If you do not know this precious saint, she's an angel. We're at the roost having our coffee on I mean, Tuesday morning. They know us there in uh, where we go to solve life's problems. And, and I decide I'm going to tell Lenny my dream. And I got my neck in, and I'm drawing the mountains. And I'm telling her about the pink elephant showing up and how I, it's all made up of little blow dryers and roulette wheels. It's like this artistic masterpiece that I didn't draw. And then I get to the part where I'm in the locker room with the girl telling her that, you know, Sometimes you feel unseen, and I, and I finish, and I look up at Lynn, and she's crying. And I go, are you, are you okay? And she goes, I get it. And I said, you get my dream? And she goes, I get your dream. And I said, tell me. And she, and she started crying. She goes, it's me. She goes, I'm the speck. Go back to the mountain, sorry. She goes, I'm the speck on that mountain. Detached, distant unseen like nothing that i do matters she goes so what if i go once a month with you to birthday girls and i buy some gifts for a homeless lady and we eat pizza and take pictures she goes that's fun for me she goes so what if i work at the dream center wiping off the handlebars of shopping carts so that the people can go and get their free food anybody can do that she goes so what if i'm part of a planning group where we make mats for homeless people out of Walmart sacks. She goes, I don't know how to make the mat. All I do is just lay the Walmart sacks out so the people with the talent can make the mat. She goes, I see all of those little individual things as the pink blow dryers and the roulette wheels. Individually, they don't matter. She goes, but God sees all of them together. And to him, I'm a beautiful masterpiece. And she goes, I need to start looking differently at the things that I'm doing. And I broke. That was it. That was it. She, I mean, it was just like, oh my goodness. And so if you are in this room right now and you are tearing up, this dream isn't just for Lynn. This dream was for you. God wants you to know that all the little things that you might be doing 
for others. You're not getting to do much of anything for yourself. He sees all of those individual things, and you are a beautiful little pink elephant to him. And so uh, about a week later, a lady comes to the RV park. I have a, we have an RV out at Bob Sandlin, and we go up there on occasion, and the lady came and returned something she had borrowed. She said, can you pray for me? She goes, I'm really having a hard time. And I said, well, what's wrong? She said, well, I wouldn't care right now if I got cancer and died. And I said, well, wh why are you so sad? And she goes, well, I lost my mother during COVID. I lost my fiance during COVID, and that might be part of it. She goes, but I've had to sell my mom's house. I've had to move into an RV out here. I've had to switch cities, switch jobs. I have no friends. She goes, my daughter had to come out of college. She's living with me in this trailer. She goes, I just thought at this point in my life, I would be so much further along. And I said, can I share a dream with you? And so we sit across my little table and I get a piece of paper and I draw the mountains. I draw the dot. And then I tell her the whole story about how it's a pink elephant. And then I tell her what Lynn said. I'm the speck on the mountain and nothing that I'm doing matters. But God saw her as all the things, as a beautiful pink elephant. And she just started to weep and she just hugged me. And she's like, that's how I felt. But now I feel so much better. She's like, I need to get myself a necklace with a little blow dryer or a little pink elephant on it so that I can remember every day how God sees me because he sees me differently than I see me. A couple weeks later, I'm at the shelter getting ready to teach. Sister Helen Johnson, who is the founder of House of Hope Women's Shelter for 16 years, is probably a woman that I look up to the most as far as walking out the love of Christ. And we've been crossing paths. I hadn't seen her in months. And so I went into her office after class. She motioned me through the glass window and we hugged. We hadn't seen each other. It seemed like forever. And she said, Shay, she started crying. She goes, I need help. And I said, what's wrong, Sister Helen? And she says, well, I was trying to take some time off because I'm tired. Um, she's in her 80s. She goes, I'm tired. I was trying to train somebody so that they could take some of the load off and maybe one day I could like release the reins to them. And she goes, I have health issues that I'm trying to deal with. And she goes, and that situation did not work out. So I find myself back here and I just feel so detached. She's like, I don't feel like the girls are listening to me. I, I don't feel comfortable asking for financial help from people because I've just been, I've pulled back for too long and I, and, I, and I just feel like nothing that I'm doing is making a big difference anymore. And I said, Sister Helen, can I share a dream with you? And I get a notepad off of her paper and I tell her the dream. And when I get to the part where Lynn said, I feel like all these little things are blow dryers and little roulette wheels and in and of themselves mean nothing. But God sees you as a beautiful little pink elephant. She broke. She just started hugging me and she grabbed that notepad and she goes, can I have it? And I'm like, yes, would you like my autograph on that piece of artwork? Just trying to lighten the mood a little. And she's just like, I have a new understanding of how he sees me. And so a couple weeks later, January of 2022, this year was her birthday. And uh, I found a little pink. In fact, that's what I found for her. And it was on a little necklace. And so I wrapped it in some tissue and I put it in a little box for her. And I took it into her office on her birthday. And, I, and she's like, oh, hi, Shay. She's totally different spirit about her. She's like, hi, Shay, so good to see you, honey. And I'm like, it's happy birthday day. And she's like, oh, you didn't have to get me anything. I wasn't expecting. And as soon as she saw what it was, she slammed that lid shut and clutched it to her gut and just started crying. She said, this is the most thoughtful gift anybody's ever given me. Just a little pink porcelain. I mean, it was just a little pink jeweled elephant. All those little stones represent every little thing that she did that God saw as a whole. And so I had no idea that this dream was gonna encourage me as much 
as it did when I started sharing it with others. And the irony is, the people that it has affected the most are women that I've shared it with one-on-one, -on -one, like the girl in the locker room. And so, I thought the dream was for me, to get me over the frustration and the feeling like I had disappointed God. I thought the dream was for me. Then I realized, actually the dream was for me, but not for what happened in the past three years, being like MIA. He gave it to me because he knew what 2022 was gonna bring across my path. January 2022. Daddy Bob and Miss Rethia, if anybody knows Bob Gamble and Rethia Gamble, um, they're very special people to the people in this church that have been here for a long time. They're like our parents, we've adopted them. And Rethia's been battling paralysis from her feet that moves up to her legs, and she's gone to doctors, countless doctors, hospitals, rehabs. Everybody tells her they can fix her, but it just keeps getting worse, it's to the point where she's wheelchair bound with very little movement in her legs. And Bob was desperate, and he's like, I'm getting her into UT Methodist, but I need Jim and you to follow me over there because I can't get her in and out of the car into the wheelchair. He's got a bad back. So January 4th, we follow them to UT Methodist, and uh, we sit in the emergency room for eight hours with tons of COVID patients. I don't know what we expected anything different to happen to us, but um, so a couple days later, she's finally in... The exam, or actually it was eight hours later, they put her in her exam room, then waited a whole nother 24 hours to do anything with her. So Jim and I are in a hotel across the road waiting for, you know, are they gonna give her a room? What's, you know? So we went into the hallway. We're waiting for the doctors to come out of her room. Daddy Bob comes out and he says, they have just diagnosed Rethia with ALS. Now that was not what we expected. And I'm just thinking, how did, why did it take so stinking long two years for somebody to figure out what's going on with, with mom. Like, ah. Uh. So they put her into a room, and they're going to try to get her into the ALS rehab, which is down the street. Might take a couple days. So during these couple days, Daddy Bob is staying with her, and Jim and I are in the waiting room. We're trying to, you know, one person at a time. It was back then. And they finally, uh, Bob texts one morning, and he's sicker than a dog. So Jim and I go, Jim takes me to the ER, I sit with Rethia, he's got COVID. Well, now they're testing Rethia. Rethia has COVID. So now she doesn't get to go to the rehab. Instead, they, they send her to the 10th floor and kick all of us out. We can't go up there and be her caretaker. She is scared, she is alone, she is unable to move. They're up there dealing with people on vents and all she had was Omicron. She had a cold. She was helpless, and we were helpless to help her. So we came back to Longview, and of course, we're in a Petri dish with, with Bob, and so it's just inevitable. Jim gets it first, and then I get it again, and we've already had it, so it was very easy for us. But then that, it wasn't snowed, but it was ice storm of some sort that hit in the middle of January, and we were trapped there. So. What I thought was going to be a couple days in January going to Dallas turned from January 4th to January 26th. <laughs> we are at Bob's house. No peopling, no church. I didn't even get to greet. No teaching at the shelter. It was just a month of isolation. The day after I get home, my daughter's scheduled for foot surgery because she had broke her foot. Two more months of being a caretaker. No church, no peopling, no teaching at the shelter. And then she gets done at the end of March. So if you guys wondered, where's Shay for three months? That's where Shay was. April, I get my eye surgery. It's June 27th. We're still going through this process. But God knows my tomorrow. And I trust him in that. And I'm just going along for the ride. But Martha Whitaker, I'm going to make you stand up, my dear. Amen. I am going to make you stand up. Um, she deserves a standing ovation, but I'm just saying. This woman has been my seeing eye friend, I call her. She literally, she drives me to the shelter every Monday morning so that I can still do the one thing that I love to do. She reads my revelation notes and I'll be like, 
Okay, so this is what little, okay, go. And then she reads some more. She makes it possible for me to teach. And then she drives me to the grocery store. She, she drives me anywhere I need to go. She brings me to church. Um, she drops me where I need to, I mean, just my husband's been at flight school for a month. So I just wanted to say thank you to you for everything that you have selflessly done for me. A dash of salt to you, a masterpiece. A masterpiece to God. I am allowed to take these off in dark rooms, but there's no outside light, but these lights are, they're, I'm so used to being in my, my goggles that it's hard for light. I do want to tell a couple things on Martha, though. Um, she is a widow on a fixed income, and as I've gotten to know her, I realize that when God made her, I think he broke the mold. I don't know that I've ever met anybody quite like her. Selfless to the utmost. So she has fixed income. She's got this little RV that she used to rent out for extra income. And when one of her sons had a friend in his 20s that was an addict, um, needed a place to stay, she let that 20-year-old boy stay in that RV for free until he could get on his feet and get clean. And he is now married, has beautiful children, is doing great, and credits Martha for changing the trajectory of his life she talked a family member out of getting an abortion, and that baby's a teenager now. In 2016, when her son needed a place to live with, and I'm going to try to get this right, Miss Martha. Her son had a wife, five children, one grandchild, four dogs, four frogs, two lizards, two fish, no, two birds, five fish, anyway. There was no room in the RV for all that zoo. She lets them move into her house. There's no room for Martha. So she moves into a shed in the back of her yard. It's a craft building, an 18 by 24. That's a shed. No running water. No toilet. She has to go across the yard for that. Now, since they have built her a bathroom and a shop, in a closet, but selfless, she still lives in it, guys, so that people can have a home in which to live. So last year, her grandson, grown grandson, got in odds with his daddy and needed a place to live, and he wasn't going to stay at daddy's house. She comes to the rescue. What does she do? Guys, what do you think Martha does? He moves into her shed and sleeps on a couch at the foot of her bed until he can get a job and get on his feet and get things back together. Well, he is since now married to this gorgeous woman right down here, Ty. He's got a job and it's all, and he feels her love because she came to his rescue and there was nobody there that he felt like for him. She will help anybody with anything. The church, I don't know, she's here all the time working at the church. She would just do anything for anybody. Jody and Courtney Clements, are you all in here? Will you stand up? Sorry, calling you guys out too. A tree fell on. This is Jody and Courtney. Get a good look at their faces. Hang on. These two are salt shakers. Stand up. A tree fell on her house smashed her fence, and she had no idea how she was going to be able to get it paid for and get it removed. Jody finds out, gets his chainsaw, comes to her house, cuts up the tree, stacks the wood, fixes her fence, and doesn't charge her a dime. Why? Because it was a dash of salt to him. Amen. It was a miracle for her. <laughs> and it was a masterpiece to God. They have a ministry here called 2020 Vision Ministries where the whole purpose is to go out into the, to the towns around us and do random acts of kindness for people. I can think of no greater <sighs> that the Lord is just smiling with every act of kindness that you guys do and the team that you get together to do those things. I don't know if Myra Kobe is here today. Myra, are you here? Nope, not here today. Um, Myra Kobe... Shannon and Amanda were going through a season in the 2020 COVID. Uh, she had COVID, and she got it in her lungs. 
So she's isolated in a room, and Shannon just got back from back surgery. He's isolated in the room, separate. They can't even take care of each other. And Amanda said that one day Myra called her out of the blue and just prophesied over her Ezekiel 37, 5 through 10, and said, read this, read this. The Lord told me to give this to you. And Amanda said that, you know, she's reading it out loud. And she just began to weep because she knew that the Holy Spirit was just speaking directly to her body, her soul, and her spirit. And uh, verse 5 says, and the sovereign Lord says, I will breathe my breath into you, and I will bring life. I will bring life back into you. And she goes, and I just clung to that. And Myra has no idea that her obedience that day really helped strengthen her faith. And then um, there was a group. If I call your name, just stand up. E.J. Ronnie, Tabitha Germain, uh, Martha, Melinda and Jerry aren't here. They were going through a really dark season, and Amanda said, one day I looked out my window, and I see these friends of mine marching around the perimeter just praying. She goes, they never came to the door. She goes, you just have no idea what I did for my spirit. She goes, you literally could feel the shift in the spirit because of their prayers. And then during that time when they had COVID and his back surgery, the Van Pools, another key family in our church, got COVID. And the D Hearts, we all lost Mr. Monty all at the same time. Marissa Sellers, where are you, my dear? Please stand up. Marissa Sellers doesn't skip a beat. She makes this huge cauldron of soup, <laughs> breaks it into meals, and drives to three different cities to make sure that these families knew that somebody loved them and was looking out for them. And she goes voluntarily twice a week to Miss Rethia's house. I love Miss Rethia like my mama. For, for just a volunteer, because she's a caretaker, she gives her a shower twice a week and does her hair and does her nails and just pampers Miss Rethia. Why? Because she's a salt shaker. Just a dash of salt to you, but Marissa, that's a masterpiece to God for what you do. And when we moved from the Summit Club into the mall, she came from work every single day to that mall and helped work to get that place ready. Her husband, Daniel, I know I won't get that man to stand up. He's probably hiding in a corner somewhere. <laughs> he built the stairs at the mall that we started to use as the altar. And I know for a fact, he bought chairs for this church twice before he was ever even a member. A dash of salt, Daniel. It's a masterpiece to God. A lady named Julia that just started coming to our church. I don't know if Julia's here today. But she goes, she, has, she met Rethia one time. She goes every Thursday to have devotions with Rethia and do physical therapy with her. Y'all, pink blow dryer to you? Masterpiece to God. What you guys are doing for others is seen. Dora and Isaac. Dora, are you here? Dora? They're in the back, and the, you're both in the sound booth? Okay. I, don't, I can't see, so I'm just trusting that you're both in the sound booth. Dora came to Revive in 2020, and then she got her eyes set on the blue-eyed hunk in the sound booth named Isaac, and they got married at the end of 2020. Within that first year, her grown son lost his place to live, and um, they let him move in with them on their newlywed honeymoon year. Now, I don't know about you, but um, that's a hard year for most people, let alone having a grown man in the next room. So hats off, that's more than a dash of salt, but they helped counsel him and encourage him and help him find another place to live. Pouring salt, dash of salt, guys, just a dash of salt. In the blizzard that Jim and I were trapped at Daddy Bob's house, now, these two need to go on Survivor. No running water, no electricity. Somehow they managed to make food. And then get in a car and come across slippery, icy roads to bring us food. We all had COVID. And then because she's a nurse, she would come in and check on Daddy Bob. I mean, just huge, huge blessing to all of us. And Daddy Bob said, I don't know what I ever did to deserve these two. I'm just so thankful that I have them. 
and I have to rip on him because he's like my dad, and I said, oh, it's nothing you did. It's Miss Rethia. We're all here for Miss Rethia. You just get to benefit for all the salt she's shaked around all these years. We love Daddy Bob. Um, but that's not the only family that Isaac has adopted. He adopted Daddy Bob, too, as his parents. Mama Sherry and Papa Sam are a couple in our church, and Papa Sam has since gone to be with the Lord, but he, Sherry told me, she goes, Isaac would drive an hour to come spend time with us. He would eat with us. He would play cards with us. Because I remember one time he helped me rip up all the old carpet in my house. And I got a lot of furniture, y'all. And her furniture is antique furniture. So it is like, she goes, I never could have done it without him. So Isaac, a dash of salt, a masterpiece to God. Amen. Mama Sherry, stand up, Mama Sherry. Mama Sherry is one of the strongest people that I know. She reminds me of my mother. Um, she makes everybody feel special because they are special to her. Um, she's given me a standing invite to come to her house and watch time travel movies and play with her kitties when Jim's out of town because she knows I love those two things. She will spend months making quilts for people that have a special occasion coming up. She spent years doing a food ministry out of a van that she bought where she would just get food and just take it out to people. Uh, she moved two granddaughters in with her when they were in their 20s and going through that rough stage, led both of them to the Lord. One of them was so radically transformed that when they moved back in with their mother, the mom didn't even recognize her. And that girl has since married her high school sweetheart, has two beautiful grandchildren, and is doing great. Attributes the change of the, her life and says, she just loved me through those years when I didn't have anybody's love. That was Mama Sherry. She just is a salt shaker. Mama Sherry, one day I'm going to make you a shirt. If anybody has a silhouette or a cricket, I'm just going to give you an idea right now. It needs to say on the front, there she goes. And on the back, it's going to say, just shaking her salt shaker. <laughs> and you're going to wear it. She always tells me she's God's favorite. And then after listening to some of your stories, I really don't know that I can argue with you on that one. Jerry and Melinda couldn't be here today, but they are salt shaker people. Um, Jerry owns l &R Automotive here in town, and he has worked on... Raise your hand if you've had Jerry work on your vehicle. <laughs> there are hands. For any of you that see all these hands, you might want to switch mechanics. Just saying. He will buy cars that do not work. He will pour his time, his money... To getting these cars running and he will either give them away or he will sell them with little or no profit to people in need Martha broke down in Gilmer one year 30 minutes from here she calls Jerry Jerry's daughter was the receptionist and he's like Nikki get in the car go get Martha so she leaves work drives to Gilmer gets Martha brings Martha home and at the end of the day when Jerry's done he loads up a trailer he drives 30 minutes to Gilmer he loads up her car vehicle, brings it back, and fixes it. Doesn't charge her a dime for the towing because he's a salt shaker. It's just a dash of salt to him. Yeah. Masterpiece to God. Melinda, there are people that come to this church every Sunday only because she leaves her house an hour early to go to different towns to pick people up. Yeah. And then after church, she drives and takes them all home. Yeah. She's helped with Jerry's grandmother. She's now helping with Jerry's mother. Because Martha moved out of her craft studio, she didn't have a craft studio. 2017, Martha had lost her job after 27 years, is devastated, calls her friend. Her friend goes, I think it's about time we turned that building next to Jerry's shop into your craft studio. So they just confiscate this spare building and gave it to Martha as a craft studio. And she says, Melinda has no idea that that really got me through that time. I could go there every day, and it just brought such joy into my life during that. And Melinda may not know what that split-second decision did for Martha, but if she watches this, she will. So these two go to garage sales and buy sewing machines for a song. They might not be working. They try to fix them. Then they let ladies who want to learn how to sew come to the craft or the studio, and they teach them how to sew on the machine. And then they give them the machine so that they have a free machine. 
I just think it's just such an amazing way that you can give back into people. Um, they're the ones that started the every other, well, every second Saturday of every month breakfast, women's breakfast, because we had to compete with the guys, right? So Martha and Melinda are like, okay, we're not going to be outdone. So they started heading up the second Saturday women's breakfast. Well, then they started an every Friday coffee connection um, in town for ladies that want to get together at 10, 10 in the morning and have coffee. The motto is we're going to change lives one cup at a time. Well, there's a lot of ladies that couldn't come because they work. So what are they going to start in July, Melinda? She's a circle of friends. They're going to meet at night at the studio on Thursday nights. So if you want a chance to connect with women and you work during the day, get with Melinda. She's going to start a circle of friends where you guys can get together and just do life with each other and pour into each other because that is what it is all about. Terry and Diane aren't here today. I wish they were so desperately, but they're not. They're pouring into people. They're salting. Just how they're salting because that's what they do. But they owned fast food convenience stores. And I know that there was a mother who had two boys that they helped put those two boys through school. And when those two boys got ready to go to college, they paid for all those, that mother helped her send those boys to college by paying for all of the kids' books and all of their college supplies so that her children could go to college. And I found out that there was a girl named Tracy that lived in a house next to, to his, Shannon's parents. And she was their babysitter. And so I was, I've been chatting with Tracy. And she said, yeah, I was 16, my brother's 18, my younger one was 14 when the Pickards moved in and instantly asked me if I'd be a babysitter because they were starting opening up all these you know, convenience stores. She goes, that Jorinda, I think she was about six. Because that Shannon, he was just a toddler. I couldn't even rein that boy in. He was just all over the place. And she said, but my family life was not ideal. And she goes, so Diane, after a while, she knew she needed to help our, the kids. She marched right over to my dad and said, this is how it's going to be. I'm taking Tracy home to live with us, and I'm going to raise her. And she goes, and that's what they did. And then my big brother got an apartment for my little brother. She goes, but if it were not for Terry and Diane, we wouldn't have been able to stay together. I don't know what would have happened to any of us. She goes, they raised me like I was their own. And, she, and the thing that's like the first things you mention are like, these are the things that really, she goes, they bought me my first stereo. It had a record player in it. And, and I mean, she was just so excited about that. She goes, they bought me my first robe because mine was all tattered. She goes, I was the angriest person on the planet. And they put up with far more than they should have put up with, with me. She goes, but they taught me everything. She goes, Terry taught me how to negotiate. I mean, he's just like the master businessman. She goes, he taught me everything I needed to know about negotiation. And Miss Diane, she taught me compassion, understanding, and forgiveness. And she goes, in all those years, she never said one negative thing about my parents. And I'm so thankful for that because I really looked up to her and she could have tainted my opinion. And she never said one negative thing. She goes, and when it was time for me to get married, they threw my wedding in their yard and it was perfect. It was beautiful. She says, but the one thing that I think I remember the most that they taught me was what it looked like when two people that love each other, what they could do to help children. She says, they showed me what that looked like. And so that was what I was going to say, you know, to, to Diane and Terry if they were here today. But I wanted you guys to know that Tracy just sent me a text last night. She goes, please, please, please. Don't forget to tell Terry and Diane, thank you for giving me a safe place to sleep. Y'all, there's a lot of people in here who have given other people a safe place to sleep. And you need to know that might have been a dash of salt to you. But that was the last thing she wanted me to thank them for. Giving her a safe place to sleep. Last but not least, Shannon and Amanda, I'm going to call you guys out. <laughs> Would you stand up? I think you guys might know who they are. I'm going to get through this. In 2015, the Lord began to speak to these two 
about stopping everything that they were doing in their lives and starting a church called Revive. And they used to meet at the Summit Club restaurant where they had to rent out every Sunday a bunch of different rooms so that they had classrooms for the kids and a bigger sanctuary for us. They'd load up a U-Haul hours and hours early, get up there and set up all the stage, and then after service, spend hours and hours tearing it all back down, loading it in a U-Haul and taking it home. They opened up their house so that we could have Wednesday night Bible studies in their home. And then when he found the mall, the bounce house, then it turned into months of extensive rehab, just putting their lives on hold so that people, pouring into people, dash of salt here, dash of salt there, masterpiece to God. So then we move into this, our forever home maybe, um, and it needed to have lots of stuff done because this used to be like a, a go-karts and it was an amusement park, basically. And he became the general contractor. Well, that's not his strong suit. No. Nope. But he's, he's trying to save money and do what we can do with the hands and feet that we have. So if you helped in any way with the revamp of this building, would you just stand up real quick? Anybody that helps, stand up. a lot of people that are behind this vision that they have. Uh, they have given us a place to do life together. Most of all, they've given us a place to come and gather for strength so that we can scatter for service because that is what it is all about. Dash of salt. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask you guys some questions because some of you might be feeling or have felt like what I do doesn't matter. I'm the speck on the mountain. If you have ever adopted or fostered children that were not your biological, absolutely not your biologicals, would you stand up? If you've ever adopted or fostered, please stand up. <laughs> Keep stand, just stay up. Just go ahead and stand. You are salt shakers because that's not just a dash here. That is a daily pouring out to people that were not even your own. If you have ever let somebody move into your house for any length of time that was not one of your children, I want you to stand up. Oh my word. You gave people a safe place to sleep when they needed it most. If you have ever given money to anybody in need, would you please stand up? And the rest of the <laughs> My dad is 86. He no longer can like do eBay. So what does he do now to help raise money for the orphanage in Thailand? He goes into his basement where he has hand cut trees, soaked them in some concoction in a bucket, gets on his lathe, makes homemade birdhouses that look like giant acorns, adorable sells them online to give the money to the orphanage in Thailand. He is still salt, salting the kingdom. If you have ever given clothes to anybody that needed clothes, would you please stand up? If you've ever visited anybody in jail, nursing home, or the hospital, will you please stand up? If you've ever prayed for anybody that needed prayer, Will you please stand up? When you've done it unto the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it unto him. You may not have a stage and you may not have a title, but let me tell you, you have a ministry. You are the salt of the earth. Amen? So I'm going to end with a poem. You can sit down. Thank you all. I'm going to end with a poem that sparked the whole title a dash of salt, and it is called The Dash. The font is big enough, y'all could probably see it from the front row, but I'm struggling. The Dash by Linda Ellis. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. 
He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke of the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the times they spent alive on earth. And now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live in love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. To be less quick to anger and show appreciation more. And love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you lived your dash? You are the salt of the earth, and your life is but a dash. Amen. 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 Uh, this might have been a blessing to you to let you preach, but I think I speak for everyone in here. You just blessed our socks off. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Shay, from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you so very much. Jim, thank you so much for sharing your wife with the rest of us, for encouraging her, and for, uh, for dashing salt on her and watering her with the word uh, like you guys do. Um, well, you guys, thank you all for, for uh, allowing the Holy Spirit to move today, um, to extend praise and worship a little bit, uh, to stay a few extra minutes and let this message be watered on all of you um, or be dashed on all of you. What a fantastic, incredible message, Shay. Thank you for being obedient to the Lord um, when he gives you a dream for not just forgetting about it by the time lunch gets here, but for seeking God and figuring out what is God trying to tell me and how, what a blessing it was that you sought that out for all of us. When you seek God, it's not always just for you. It's for the dash of salt that you have. I love, it's a dash of salt to those folks or to you, but it's a masterpiece to God. And I don't know about you guys, but I certainly feel like that little blow dryer or roulette wheel all the time. Very, very good to be reminded God sees all that little stuff as a masterpiece. Man, what a great message. You guys, one word that came to mind when she was sharing all of those people, the word that came to my mind was church. That's what church is. And I don't, I don't mean, you know, Revive Church or Life Bridge Church or, or uh, Gateway Church or Grace Creek or whatever. I, I mean, the body of Christ, that's church. What she just described is exactly how church ought to be. We don't play church here at Revive Church. We are the church here at Revive Church. Amen. Thank you guys for being the church and for dashing the world with, with your salt because we got some flavor here at Revive. <laughs> Amen. Well, so listen, we're going to be dismissed, but I wanted to remind everybody, if you want special prayer, um, we'll, uh, we'll, let's go ahead and stand up and be dismissed. Uh, and if you want special prayer, um, I'll, I'll dismiss you and then just, just make your way forward. There'll be some prayer warriors up here um, that are full. Their shakers are full and ready to, to shake onto you and to help guide you, lead you, pray with you, confirm with you um, in, a, in a group setting. So if you help us, help us pray like Jody and Courtney, y'all can go ahead and, and come up. Father God, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. Lord God, we thank you so much for this special blessing today. Thank you so much for Jim and for Shay. Thank you for putting into Shay's heart what you have put into her heart for her obedience, for her diligence, and for first letting her know that she is not some speck in the background that goes unnoticed, but she is a masterpiece in the eyes of the Father. Thank you for the gifts that you've given to all of us 
and thank you for tugging on our hearts to share them with each other and for making us the church. Father God, this is not my church. It's not Shay's church. It's not Amanda's. Lord Jesus, it's your church. Have your way in it. I just pray for blessings upon blessings for all those watching online, all those in our building right now. In Jesus' mighty, holy, and precious name.